So now we're going to apply what we know about torque and angular momentum to one of the most standard problems in a freshman physics textbook right here. You've got a mass m1 hanging with a rope from a pulley, which we give a mass m2. So we have to think about its torque and angular momentum attached uh, to another mass m3. And we'll make it frictionless, because this mass is pulling along a table, and this mass is falling. And you want to find the acceleration of the system. So you can actually burn through this problem really fast. If you've seen somebody do it, if you've done it yourself, you can say, well, this angular is that, that's that, and we're done pretty quick. We may have even done this already earlier. I don't remember. But what I want to do is go through it kind of slow and show why all the terms that are 0 are 0. So I think it'll be a little bit more enlightening to do it that way. So one thing we want to remember is that we're treating the whole thing as a system. All right, so we're going to say m1 and the rope, which we're treating as a light, massless rope. m1, rope, m2, rope, m3 um, is the system. Okay, Because remember, we have to know what the system is because Newton's law says that the sum of the external torques equals dl dt. So we're going to have to think about what is external and what is internal when we try to apply some of the torques equals dl dt. We're talking about rotation, so what do we have to do? We have to pick a rotation axis. So let's pick one, the rotation axis. This is a good time to consider the difference between intelligence and wisdom. I learned the difference when I was about 13 and played Dungeons and Dragons for the first time when it was new. And those were different abilities, your intelligence and your wisdom. And the way they explained it in the D&D manual was that if you go outside and you feel water hitting your head, your intelligence tells you it's raining and your wisdom tells you to go inside or you're going to get sick, which I thought was a good uh, explanation. Here, the difference is your intelligence says, I can put the axis anywhere. Because we know the equations will work out. I could put the axis here, I could put it here, I could put it here. But your wisdom says there's one good place to put the axis for every problem, or maybe two or three good places. We're going to put it here. All right, the rotation axis is going to be the pulley axis. And you'll see why in a minute why that's helpful. So this is wisdom equals 18. You just threw six, three sixes on your wisdom when you picked that rotation axis. Uh, so here we go. Now the problem is set up. We have our system, we have a rotation axis, we've drawn it. Uh, we could think about forces in a minute. And now we got to apply this. Okay? So let's do the left side first. Let's look at the torques. Torques um, from each force. So I guess we should run through and think about the force, where force is applied to the system. So I'm going to borrow this vector symbol and say this actually we'll say is M1G. All right, that's the weight on M1. Of course, there's tension in the rope. There's tension in the rope. There's actually, if you think about it, as this falls, the axle will apply a force to the wheel. There's what we'd call F axle. And it might not be exactly at 45 degrees. It depends on kind of what's going on, but I'll draw it that way. Um, of course, the wheel pushes on the axle as well, Newton's third law, but we're thinking about the system. So that's getting pushed on. There's M3G there, 3G, three, three the weight of M3. And there is um, a normal force here, right? normal force pushing back up from the, from the table. And there's tension. Let's see, did I miss anything? Oh, yeah, and there's M2G straight down. The, uh, the, the disk has its own weight, its own weight force. And why doesn't it fall? Again, the axle's getting involved, right? So the axle force does something. OK, so we've got to get the torque from each one of these. So let's just go through them one by one and see what we get. F axle. <coughs> what does the torque do to F axle? Well, fortunately, the force would be hard to get, but we don't care because it's sitting right on the axis of rotation. So the torque due to the axle is 0 because it's the R value, R cross F, the R would be 0. So that's one that is zero for that reason. If we had to put our axis of rotation here and done everything, we have to think about what that force is. We'd have to get it. Yeah, that doesn't sound fun. What about um, M2G? All right. 
the weight of the uh, disk. Oh, again, M2G, it's acting at the axis of rotation. So by placing that axis of rotation, you can eliminate a few that you don't want to deal with. Torque of M2G equals zero. So both of these are uh, because, in this case, little r equals zero. So as I do this problem, the definition of little r is going to constantly change. Little r is the little uh, displacement vector for calculating r across, uh, r across p, or r across f. r across f for a torque, r across p for, a, um, for an angular momentum. Okay, so those are zero. Let's see what is on my list here. Uh, M1g, let's look at M1g. Let's see, that's this one. Okay, so it's acting right there. Now this is one of the cases where you could go really fast and just say the answer. But let's go through and really calculate it and it'll help you maybe see uh, more what's going on here. So here's the wheel. And I'm going to draw it kind of exaggerated so you can see the geometry a little better. Here's M1, like this. And uh, here's the radius of the wheel, or the disk, right, big R. And really, the torque, remember, is always R cross F. So in this case, the torque for M1G, we've got to think about these vectors. Here's the vector R. It's acting at the center of mass, so it's from the axis rotation to the center of mass. So for this calculation, that's r. Remember, little r is going to keep changing and changing and changing. The force is straight down, mg, like that, m1g. So that's the cross product we have to take. So let's draw it uh, tail to tail, right? We like to draw these things tail to tail. So r is kind of like that, m1g is like that. So the theta that we need is right there. All right. So we're going to say then the torque mg, oops, I drew it as a vector. Let's stop doing vectors for now. Everything will be in or out of the board. Um, it's the magnitude r times the magnitude of f, m1g times the sine of theta, the angle between them. Right. So there's your angle. That's all we got to do. But we don't really want to leave little r in there. It'd be nice to write these not in terms of little r, because little r, for one thing, is going to change as things move, and there's little r's all over the place. We'd like it to be in terms of big R. So the reason I drew this again is to show you the geometry you can use. If this is little r, and that's big R, there's a right, oops, there's a right triangle right there. Right triangle. And we can say there's sine theta. What is sine theta equal to? So you can see, convince yourself that this theta is equal to this theta, right? Because if we just continue this line straight down and add them tail to tail, that angle equals that angle because it's just two lines crossing. So if that's theta, sine of theta is opposite, which is big R, over hypotenuse little r. Aha, so r, m1g, sine theta, big R over little r. And then you see those r's cancel. And then you see, actually, the torque due to m1g is just big R m1g. So there you go. So if you've calculated a lot of torques, you would do that automatically. I'll show you this again when we do angular momentum. If you have something at an angle like this, it really depends on just the distance to the line uh, that's perpendicular to the axis. We'll look at that in more detail. But I just want to show you, you really do get it from the geometry. Things really do cancel in a way that as this thing falls and that angle changes, the torque is always just big R mg. Right? Those are all constants in the problem. Okay, so that's a few forces. We'll do a few more in the next video.